During World War II, about 10,000 German prisoners of war were kept right here in Florida. So today, we're gonna to pay a visit to one of the largest POW camps of that time, which is Camp Blanding. So Camp Landing was not just for POWs. Uh, in fact, they made this one of the largest training facilities in the country at the time. Um, so a lot of infantry divisions would come through here and train before being deployed overseas. Um, some of those infantry divisions you may have heard of, uh, the Big Red One, uh, which is the first infantry division. Uh, the 29th infantry division also came through here to train before being mobilized overseas. Um, they played a pretty pivotal role, especially on D-Day but almost 800,000 soldiers would rotate through Camp Blanding during World War II. So we're about to go to the Camp Blanding Museum. Um, and outside of that, uh, they have World War II vehicles all over this place uh, that we can go see. So we're gonna hit the museum first, and then we're gonna check out some of the monuments and vehicles they have here. We're off to a pretty good start. We haven't even made it inside the museum yet. And here we have a six inch gun that manned a coastal battery in England. And you can see the rifling in the barrel here that made these things deadly accurate. So now we're in the museum. And right off the bat, this is a flag that was draped over the coffin of a soldier who was killed here in a training accident. This was the very first soldier killed here. And here's his portrait. Now Camp Blanding was named after Major General Blanding. And this is his uniform. Very cool. These are different dog tags from different nations from World War II. Very cool. And they're numbered, so you can kind of see which nation wore them. And it's from the dog tag that the Germans wore. So this notch on the dog tags is not for your teeth. It is, so this machine can engrave your information on the tag. You learn something every day. So when the U.S. got involved in World War II, they honestly weren't prepared. They had a lot of World War I era uniforms, rifles. So this is what their uniform would have looked like at the onset of the war. And just several helmets on display. This one sticks out to me, obviously. Very cool. And like I said, like you just saw the soldier wearing one of these. This is what the British wore and what we wore in World War I. And eventually we would upgrade to this helmet and we'd wear it all the way until after Vietnam, where we would move to this helmet. Now in the beginning of the video, you heard me talk about Camp Landing and POWs. Like I said, they kept about a thousand here at any given time. So this is a replica of what the POW camp looked like here. Now they were organized in the companies and each company had their own area to eat and use the restroom and their own washroom. They also had a recreation field. Now they did have a small contingent of uh, SS and Nazi party members, but they were kept in a separate area. Not sure how many they had, but it wasn't very many, but they did keep them isolated. 
So now we see a few pictures from this camp. Some of these articles talking about life in the POW camp here. They don't look miserable, honestly. <laughs> overhead sketch of the compound that we saw in that scale model. Now we're heading over to the infantry divisions that trained here and like we touched on the big red one was here a train so it has some of their engagements that they were in including that picture in the middle D-Day Here's more of the infantry divisions. The 30th, Old Hickory. This one, again, you may have heard of, the 29th. And here's their notable symbol. This is just really cool. Some of these divisions you don't really hear about. 36th, Texas National Guard Unit. And here's the 43rd, Wing Victory did a really good job kind of providing a brief synopsis of the units that trained here. And unfortunately during that time, we were still dealing with some segregation, but they're touching on African-American units that also trained here. And some of their units, bring it into focus here. You have the 45th Engineers, 97th. And 92nd Infantry Division. see what a bunk room would have looked like at Camp Landing for the soldiers training. Now we're coming to a mortar pit. Looks like 60 millimeter and a 81 millimeter mortar, which obviously that's the bigger one. And the 60 millimeter right here. Now we have a soldier with a mine detector. And here we have some of the mines that they may have found. Really cool shoe mine that was anti-personnel. It was wood, so it was very hard to detect. Kind of like your modern day IED. It's very hard to detect, very little metal. And of course, the famous image of MacArthur making his return to the Philippines. Now, this is every soldier's best friend, is the medic. And they're giving a good visual on what his job would have entailed during World War II. Holding some plasma. And some of the things he would have carried. So now we're entering the Pacific Theater. And this soldier looks a little different. Um, so this is what a US soldier would have looked like. A couple years into the war, you see he has a different helmet. Uniform looks a little lighter. Still has that Springfield, but this would eventually be an M1 Grand, unless you were a sniper. And they also have what a Japanese soldier would have looked like. Some of the weapons he would have carried. I believe they carried Arasaka rifles. Again, those are bolt action as well. And here was some of the arms that the Axis would have carried. Now, this one is called a Stern Gewehr. If you kind of look at it, it looks like an AK-47. Well, that's because this is the first automatic assault rifle, and Kalashnikov 
got his hands on one of these bad boys at the end of the war and modeled the AK-47 after it. So, you can thank this guy for the AK-47. Now we're going to the guns of the Allies. Now this first one looks weird. It was called a grease gun. Uh, it was pretty compact, so if you were in a tank or another vehicle or airborne, you would shoulder one of those. And here's that M1 Garand, which would be the upgrade from the Springfield. BAR, pack the punch, carbine, and a few others down here. Now here you have a few of the quote unquote cruiser weapons. You have a German MG34, which put out a horrific rate of fire. And the Type 96 carried by the Japanese. Now I did not know this, but apparently contingents of the 508th trained here. And here is their flag. And right here, you can see all the conflicts in which they've served. And this is by far one of the coolest flags. 508th Infantry Regiment. And here would be the loadout for a paratrooper in World War II. And pretty much they had to carry everything they needed on their person. And yeah, he has a carbine with a retractable stock. Saved him a little room. So we're getting ready to wrap up here in the museum. And before you leave, they have a display of the Medal of Honor. And the 46 men who trained here at some point, and they would go overseas and they would be awarded the Medal of Honor for their actions. they hit us with this. This flag here was made by three American POWs after their capture in the Philippines. <laughs> Unbelievable. Major James C. Rinneman and two other American POWs captured in the Philippines in 1942. This flag was crafted in anticipation of their liberation from imprisonment in Japan at the end of the Second World War. They just keep hitting us with things before we leave. This is a Nazi flag that was captured and signed by a bunch of U.S. soldiers. Very cool. And here's Hitler's buzzsaw. Now it was called Hitler's buzzsaw because it fired 1,200 rounds a minute. It's crazy. And you were able to change out the barrels pretty quick. And there it is. This is just a view from the back. Again, the museum is on this first floor, but uh, upstairs, that's where the hotel rooms were. And that's where the families would come visit before the soldiers were deployed overseas. And back this way, you can see a C-47 there, which I'm very excited to see. Uh, they have World War II vehicles and memorials, which we're about to go check out. Now, some of you may know what plane this is, but for those who don't, this is a C-47, which you may know of played a huge role in the Allies' invasion of Normandy. It would drop paratroopers behind enemy lines. It would also uh, help transport wounded soldiers, they would transport supplies. Um, so this was a well-versed plane, but notably, it had the biggest impact on D-Day. 
dropping elements of the 101st and 82nd behind enemy lines. Now, I'm not 100% sure on this, I could be wrong, but these black and white stripes were painted on the bottom of aircraft to hopefully avoid friendly fire. And here we have a Sherman tank, which in a one-on-one -on -one matchup with German tanks wouldn't fare too well unless it can get behind the more heavily armored German tanks. But one thing that we had on our side was numbers and the allies produced a ton of these tanks. So Germany takes out a couple of them. There were five more to take its place. And over here we have a half track. These things are pretty versatile and it's kind of a hybrid between a truck and a tank. As you can see, the front is wheels and the back is treads. But this version looks like it would either carry supplies or men, wounded soldiers. And then we have another one here. And in the back looks like the remnants of a anti-aircraft turret. And something else they have here among the vehicles is each infantry division has its own monument. This one is the 43rd and it kind of tells you where they served. And just a quick little nugget, 26,000 of these ambulances were produced from 1942 to 1944. And Dodge was the manufacturer. And here we have a closer look at the 29th monument. Again, this unit was in the thick of it. You can see their casualties they suffered. 19,814 killed, wounded, or missing. And now, the Big Red won. All their campaigns, North Africa, Italy, Normandy, and again, 20,659 casualties throughout World War II. Now, before we wrap things up here, uh, the gentleman that's working inside told me that they have a handful of Soviet era tanks here. So I know it's a different time period, but here we can go check those out. It's not every day you get to see a tank from the Cold War. And here they are. Really cool. All right, well, luckily they have stuff talking about them because I am of no help there. So this is a BRDM-2 and it was for scouting, reconnaissance and had a crew of four. And here, which many of you have probably seen, the main Russian battle tank, T-55. And in fact, in Desert Storm, we uh, faced many of these fielded by the Iraqi army. 86,000 were produced between 1958 and 1983. Wow. And it looks like here, we have a personnel carrier can fit 10 troops. Very cool. And it looks like we have some anti-aircraft weaponry here on wheels, so extremely mobile. Wow, really cool. And actually, here is an Iraqi flag on this T-55, so not sure if it was painted on there or if this was actually captured in the Gulf War, but nonetheless, very, very cool to see.